the great majority of the population in the world don't have the benefit to operate on a daily basis with infrastructure around them. There isn't a single country that has achieved equal pay. There isn't a single country that does not have violence against women. We as a global community are losing all that creativity, all that energy, if girls don't go to school. Right now, nearly a billion people don't have access to that opportunity that, that safe water brings. As these water shortages begin and as they're already ongoing, it's going to be the communities that are already at risk that are impacted first and worst. Our inability to deal with difference is really destroying all of us, and we cannot succeed in a world where we simply try to wall each other off from one another. The biggest problem is how media can drive the masses, how it's used as a tool to brainwash people. There are people who are sick and they don't know they're sick because it's all they've ever known. The reason human trafficking is thriving is because traffickers know that they can get away with it. We have 65 million people around the world fleeing from danger, terrorism, hunger, and trying to save their life. Four million women and children die each year because of inhalation of smoke from cooking, the most basic of things that all of us do every day. If farmers don't become more productive, we're going to have to clear more and more land, which would be environmentally disastrous. We're playing a very dangerous game with nature. The mountain we have to climb is so high, and we still have so much more work to do. And I wonder sometimes if we'll ever actually be able to achieve our mission. We are so much more powerful. We are capable of so much more than we can possibly imagine. It doesn't matter how much your problems are. The determination to overcome them and, and hard work is what makes a difference. I think every social entrepreneur had someone multiple times tell them, you can't do that. And when people said that to us, you know, at first we're like, why not? And then we thought, well, you're just saying we can't do that because nobody ever has. And so we're going to, and we're gonna prove you wrong. Hopelessness is our greatest enemy. At times there is no hope, but I do believe that you cannot take out the determination from people. And determination is the concept that keeps us Going. It's hard to even imagine anything we're doing right currently that didn't stem from several previous failures. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? I believe when your passion outweighs your fear, that's when you have the opportunity to be successful. There is a force that keeps us as humanity, as humankind, moving forward. We have been improving humankind for years. It is possible to create a world in which we prioritize every single person. Don't tell me I can't do it. Don't tell me it's never been done because that's just an invitation to do it. And then seeing the magic that happens when you do go in those uncharted territories. Look, it is possible to have conversation starters instead of conversation stoppers. It's complicated, but it's not intractable. You've got to shake a system. And if you keep shaking in multiple ways, something's going to crack. Creating change takes a long time. You don't have to make big, big changes. Each one would add up. When you put groups of people together, something greater than them emerges. Something transformative that is the most powerful thing I've ever seen, by far. Start by doing what's necessary. Then do what's possible. And then you're suddenly doing the impossible. Power lies not in marking boundaries and differentiating between cultures. Power lies in embracing our differences and offering hope to each other. So we urge all of you powerful people out there to take an oath of spreading happiness by truly believing in the fact that our unity lies in our diversity.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Lindsay Spindle and Peter Drobak. Thank you, Desi Hoppers, for that extraordinary opening to the 2019 Skoll World Forum on Social Entrepreneurship. For those of you who are attending the Skoll World Forum for the first time, welcome to magical Oxford. And yes, a little bit of rain is part of the magic, so just embrace it, it's not gonna go away. You're all in for something special this week. This year's forum is our most globally representative yet. Our 1,200 delegates hail from 81 countries around the world. This includes 75 Skoll World Forum fellows, accomplished social and environmental change leaders from 34 much sunnier countries who are joining us for the first time. To those of you who have been to the Skoll World Forum before, welcome back. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces. Peter and I are humbled to have the honor of raising the curtain tonight. But you may be wondering, where is that smooth-voiced, silver-haired, warm-hearted British bloke who has so graciously welcomed us from this stage for so many years? Where is Stefan Chambers? Has he made a Brexit? Too soon, Lindsay, too soon. <laughs> Not to worry, not to worry. Stefan is right here in the front row, sitting alongside the fearless former CEO of the Skoll Foundation, Sally Osberg. <laughs> and we're really honored to welcome you both as you join the forum this year officially as delegates. If there was an award for most treasured delegate, it would surely be a tie between Stefan and Sally. 
Yeah. Thank you. Creation often begins in odd ways. Take the Skull World Forum, for example. Jeff Skull recently reminded me that the forum was hatched amongst friends, our most treasured delegates included, on the back of a cocktail napkin at the Old Bank Hotel here in Oxford. Speaking of Jeff, he's incredibly sad that health has forced him to miss his second World Forum in a row. In his absence, I'm delighted to share some of Jeff's reflections in his own words about what this gathering means to him. In the Skull World Forum's humble beginnings, we invited about 250 social entrepreneurs to a three-day program here in Oxford. Much to our surprise, everyone came. <laughs> While their specialty in geographies, race, age, religions, and gender were mixed, they had two things in common, passion for their work and the sad belief that they were alone in what they did. The first forum was a little like Woodstock. People realized that they were not alone, that they had others with whom they would soon form a special bond, like finding long-lost family. Our hope was that we could support a community where social entrepreneurs would help each other. That's gone from 250 to 1,200 attendees, from a few events over at the Said Business School to now taking over much of the Oxford campus. My dear departed friend, Jake Eberts, wants to find a not-to-be-named global event as a lot of big shots who talk a lot but do very little whereas the Skull World Forum was all about the little shots, who talk a lot less, but do an incredible amount of very important work. Over the years, we've been proud to host both the big and little shots, from President Carter and Malala to the young leaders of tomorrow. There have been marriages and baby carriages, a volcano and a fire, star musicians and late night tone-deaf karaoke singers. <laughs> There's been fun and hard work and deep mutual respect. All of these things grew from a simple cocktail napkin at the Old Bank. The theme of the forum changes annually, but to me it's always been about the finest and most dedicated people in the world doing their best to make the world better for others. On behalf of Jeff Skoll, the Skoll Foundation Board of Directors and team and Oxford University, we are delighted to welcome you, the world's finest and most dedicated people, to a week of discoveries made and friendships formed. At this forum, we're celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Skoll Scholarship, a program that supports some of those little shots promising and proven young social entrepreneurs to earn an Oxford MBA at Said Business School. And with the support of our global community, these scholars have gone on to create astonishing impact. Their social ventures are democratizing access to renewable energy for hundreds of thousands of families living off the grid, promoting financial inclusion for the unbanked, offering legal services to social change organizations across Latin America. And that's just a few of them. Imagine what the other 70 are doing. But most importantly, the Skoll Scholars have cultivated a really close-knit community to support one another. And as we celebrate the 15-year milestone this week, many of the scholars are here with us tonight. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Our theme this year is accelerating possibility. Social entrepreneurship begins with a sense of a recognition of possibility, a way to overcome an obstacle, break a vicious cycle, expose an injustice. Accelerating possibility begins when we refuse to accept an unjust status quo. As we sit here today, we're moving at eye-popping speed, orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. Can you feel that? That's the energy we need to harness because we need to move even faster. 
We know now that we have less than 12 years to begin addressing the damage we've caused to our planet before the effects become irreversible. And meanwhile, around the world, millions of families are impatient to enjoy the peace, prosperity, and opportunity that some of us take for granted. Accelerating possibility happens when optimism meets urgency, when imagination encounters grit, and when ambition converges with humility. The 16-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg has taken the world by storm with a brave call to meet climate change with system change. Yeah, clap for her. If solutions within this system are so hard to find, she says, maybe we need to change the system itself. Greta is speaking the language of the social entrepreneur. You see, social entrepreneurs treat the system not the symptoms. And when we summon the vision to look at entire systems, new possibilities emerge for entirely different and better futures. Buckminster Fuller once said, there's nothing in the caterpillar to tell you it's going to be a butterfly. Social entrepreneurs are in the business of building butterflies. One thing that gets in the way of accelerating possibility is doubt. Can I create this? Do I have the right solution? Can we beat the clock? Am I the right person for the job? I recently read a book called How to Fly a Horse by Kevin Ashton that sheds light on these questions as it explores the topics of invention, creation, and discovery. What I love most about this book is that it breaks down the myth that creation is a sacred re act reserved just for geniuses. Instead, it showcases the less dramatic but far more hopeful truth that anyone can create. Ashton says every object in our life, however old or new, however apparently humble or simple, holds the stories, thoughts, and courage of thousands of people, some living, some dead, the accumulation of 50,000 years. Our tools and our art are our humanity, our inheritance, and the everlasting legacy of our ancestors. The things we make are the speech of our stories, stories of triumph, courage, optimism, adaptation, and hope. Tales of not one person here or there, but of one people everywhere, written in a common language, not African, American, Asian, or European, but human. This week in Oxford, in this gorgeous theater and beyond, we will celebrate your new stories of triumph. We will listen to those who exhibit remarkable courage, on occasion, we'll adapt. But most of all, we will be bound together by a warm hug of optimism that a sustainable, peaceful, and prosperous world for all remains within our reach. If, oh, thank you. <laughs> if you are harboring any doubts, please suspend them. Your next creation could be a cocktail napkin away. I do my best work on cocktail napkins. <laughs> so how will you use this week to accelerate your sense of possibility? We'd like to highlight a few things that you won't want to miss. Tomorrow evening in this space is arguably the emotional highlight of the week as the winners of the 2019 Skoll Awards for Social Entrepreneurship grace the stage and share their powerful stories. Speaking of amazing stories, you won't want to miss the Thursday evening film screening of Participant Media's The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, right here in this theater. Talk about a story of accelerating possibility.
This year, the forum will be spilling into the streets and colleges and pubs of Oxford like never before. There are over 50 ecosystem events happening all over the city. These are your events designed by you addressing the issues that you care about most. We're grateful to all of the organizations that have stepped forward to lend your voices and make this our biggest forum yet. Accelerating possibility also means expanding opportunity, especially for rising generations. That's why we're thrilled about the Skull Emerging Leaders Initiative, which this year has brought 15 young change makers from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East to Oxford. You can hear more from them Wednesday and Thursday in Story Studios. There's sure, certainly no shortage of things to do, and if you're like me, you're probably experiencing a little FOMO. But make sure, most importantly, to expect the unexpected. Your most important conversation this week may well happen with someone you had no intention of meeting. And that's what makes this community so special. So just be sure to strike up some unlikely conversations and be open to serendipity. Before we move on to tonight's program, let's return one last time to how to fly a horse. Ashton closes with a reminder that feels just right as we begin. All stories of creators tell the same truths, that creating is extraordinary, but creators are human. That everything right with us can fix anything wrong with us. And that progress is not an inevitable consequence, but an individual choice. Necessity is not the mother of invention. You are. With that, please join us in welcoming someone who designs futures for a living. Anab Jain is a designer, futurist, an educator, and the co-founder of Superflux Studios. Please welcome Anab and enjoy the Skull World Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This is a photograph from the scene of Donald Trump's inauguration following his win in the 2016 US presidential elections. In an NBC interview soon after the inauguration, Trump's advisor, Kellyanne Conway, defended the White House press, press secretary, Sean Spicer's claim that Mr. Trump had attracted the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration. When told that that wasn't quite true, she replied airily, don't be so dramatic, he gave alternative facts. Almost immediately after Conway's interview, George Orwell's classic novel, 1984, spiked to number one on Amazon. <laughs> the Twittersphere responded to this with allusions to this particular quote from the book. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. After sales for the novel shot up by 9,500%, Penguin announced plans for a special 75,000 copy reprint of Orwell's novel. What is it about such works of fiction that resonate with people in a way that hard facts don't? How can something written in 1949 be so relevant today? Given the events happening in the US and widespread anxieties around post-truth, fake news, and political disenfranchisement, people were looking for fables and stories to make sense of and navigate this strange new landscape. Unlike abstract analysis, stories like 1984 are so powerful because they, they are harmonious with the way we relate to the world. They resonate with the deep core of our experience. Because even at the level of direct engagement, the world as we experience it is a narrative construction. What we call reality is more like a narrative masterpiece rather than anything objective. And I think deep down, we know this. We rationally understand how subjective our sense of the world is, but practically forget as we go about our daily lives. From the way we perceive our day unfolding to our history and politics, it's stories all the way down. 
That said, we need to make a di distinction between allegory and deception, between stories that seek to blind us and those that enable us to navigate the world. If stories are the structure of the world, then emotions are the primary motivating force in our lives. This is not to say that data and modeling and analytics are not important. Rational thinking is deeply important, and the power of that is evident in myriad ways all around us. But what is also evident is the fallacy that what moves us to act as individuals is deep scientific rationality. We are not cold, rational actors in a Newtonian universe as much as we like to believe it. It's just not how we live, it's just not how we've evolved to live. We are emotional beings inhabiting a world of mythology and stories. Antonio Damasio challenged Descartes' logical fallacy, I think, therefore I am, in his groundbreaking work, Descartes' Im Error, Emotion, Reason and the Human Brain. Damasio argued that Descartes' error comes from this dualist separation of the mind and the body, nationality and emotion. Damasio wrote that emotions and feelings are not a luxury. They are a means of communicating our states of mind to others. But they are also a way of guiding our own judgment and decisions. Emotions bring the body into a loop of reason. Now, more than ever, it is essential that we acknowledge and build on our emotional embodiment. Today, we are in a period of accelerating change and dizzying potential for both huge transformation and catastrophic failure. No wonder many of us experience feelings of overwhelm from the increasing speed and volume of information we are exposed to. The rate of change in the world around us is disorienting. Currently, the main way we analyze and talk about these complex challenges is through vast clouds of data points. Although data can look scary, it's somehow disembodied, detached from what it references. Despite the alarming warnings about climate change, it is evident that we are having trouble acting upon this disembodied data. And data, especially about the future, feels even more disembodied and distant. FMRI studies suggest that when you imagine your future self, your brain does something weird. It stops acting as if you're thinking about yourself. Instead, it operates as if you're thinking about a completely different person. This is what behavioral economists call temporal distancing. Our tendency is to want things now rather than later. Studies by Kim and Zauberman suggest that the extent to which one discounts a future event is closely linked to how far in the future it feels. That is, it's temporal distance from the present. Perhaps if we people were able to pre-experience the future, or if it were possible to create mental simulations of the future, that would trigger episodic memory, reducing the temporal distance from the future. Episodic memory is part of our memory that helps us remember key events of the past. Neuroscientists call this the prospective brain whose primary function is to use past experiences to anticipate future events. And this is what I, my partner John Arden, and my colleagues at Superflux do. Our work focuses on the power of embodied stories and visceral experiences to simulate different possible futures and bring them into the present, into the here and the now, in order to catalyze an embodied engagement with the vast potential of the future. So how do we do this? It all starts with what we call sense-making, a wide-ranging process of analyzing data, watching trends, scanning emerging technologies, looking for ethnographic and anthropological insights, following intuitive hunches, exposing ourselves to new ideas and getting a sense of their emotional content, and reflecting on our own emotional responses. All of this to find what we call weak signals those bits of the future that arrive early into the buzzing noise of the now, finding threads of possibility in this complex chaos, and then drawing these threads out to see where they connect in order to expose the rich tapestry of what lies ahead. And that's where the real work starts, embodying the future potential in the present. But rather than explain the process, let me take you through a few projects to give you a sense of what this feels like. 
A project called Drone Avery, done in 2015, is prescient even today. For the project, we wanted to explore the growing potential of invisible and increasingly autonomous technologies through the lens of drones, because of the drone's dual function, a technology that has potential for good, but also great harm. Our interest was specifically on the, how the presence of these machines will change our lived experience of urban spaces and what it means to interact with algorithmic intelligence. Because drones have the power to see things we can't, to go places we can't, and to do so with increasing autonomy. To understand the technology, getting our hands dirty was crucial. So we built many different drones in our studio. We gave them names, functions, and flew them but not without difficulty. Things came loose, GPS signals glitched, drones crashed. But it was through such, such experimentation that we were able to construct one very experiential slice of one possible future. So now let's go to that future. Let's imagine we are living with drones like this one. It patrols the streets, often spotted in the evenings and at nights. Initially, many of us were annoyed by its low, dull hum. But then, like everything else, we got used to it. We call it the night watchman. Now, what if you could see the world through its eyes? See how it constantly logs every resident of our neighborhood, logging the kids who play football in the no ball game area and marking them as statutory nuisances. And then see how it disperses this other group who are teenagers with the threat of an autonomously issued injunction. Another one is the root hawk, an autonomous traffic management agent. At first glance, a seemingly harmless machine with a giant LED display providing dynamic warnings to drivers, but then they multiply. They're everywhere, constantly log logging traffic violations, enforcing penalties, continually searching and capturing the smallest offense. A tireless flock of automated revenue generation machines. And then there's the newsbreaker, the media drone, which feeds on our growing hunger for the very latest breaking news. As they happen, constantly monitoring emergency services and social media in real time, these nimble media devices push the boundaries of what has come to be known as high-frequency journalism. Perched across the city, they were into action as soon as a news story breaks, filming and streaming in real time. Story writing algorithms pass imagery, audio, web, and radio traffic into rapidly growing and continually edited column inches. And then there's this giant hovering disk called the medicine. Its glaring presence is so overpowering, I can't help but stare at it. But it feels like each time I look at it, it knows a little more about me. Like it keeps flashing all these adverts from Brian Eyre, as if it knows about the holiday I'm planning. I'm not sure if I find this mildly entertaining or just entirely invasive. Whilst drones like Madison and Night Watchman in these particular forms are not real yet, most elements of our drone future are in fact very real today. For example, facial recognition systems are everywhere, in our phones, in our smart gadgets, and in public city infrastructure everywhere constantly keeping a record of everything we do, whether it's an advertisement we glanced at or a protest we attended. These things are here, and we often don't understand how they work and what their consequences could be. We've engaged with numerous diverse audiences through the drones and the film, making such work a critical tool for public engagement. They have been on tour for the last four years and will continue to do so for three more years, moving across countries, screenings, and debates, catalyzing the imagination of unknown, thousands of unknown viewers, and hopefully nourishing an appetite for questioning the power of technologies and speculating on their near future potential. Public engagement is critical, but can we also use these methods for augmenting policy decisions? Because when you are making policy changes, you're not just affecting numbers on a graph, these numbers mean something very real. I want to share a project with you we did with the Ministry of Energy and the government of the United Arab Emirates. We invi they, were in they invited us to help them shape their energy strategy all the way up to 2050. 
Based on the government's econometric data, we created this large city model and visualized many different sustainable futures on it. As I was excitedly taking a group of government officers and the prime minister through one sustainable future scenario on our model, one of them told me, I can't imagine that people in the future will stop driving cars and start using public transport. In fact, I can't even tell my own son to stop driving his car. But we were prepared for this reaction. Working with scientists in a chemistry lab in my home city in India, we had created approximate samples of what the air would be like in 2030 if our behavior stays the same. And so, I walked the group over to this object that emits vapor from those air samples. Just one whiff of the noxious polluted air from 2030 brought home the point that no amount of data can. This is not the air you would allow your children to breathe. The next day, the government made a big announcement. They would be investing billions of dollars in renewables. We don't know exactly what part of future experiences played in this decision, but we know that they have changed their energy policy to mitigate such a scenario. Through such work, we are learning that one of the most powerful means of affecting change is when people can directly, tangibly, and emotionally experience the future consequences of their decisions and actions today. Let's zoom out further from a specific decision around air pollution to something that's far more complex, like climate change. Looking at data and projections like this, it is hard to imagine the unsurmountable amount of problems we might face. I have found that most people in their everyday lives are at a loss of how to make sense of such graphs. For something quite so complex, Timothy Morton has coined the term hyperobjects. According to him, we have created things that we can hardly understand, let alone control, let alone make sensible political decisions about. A new word to understand how mind-blowing it is, is hyperobjects. Hyperobjects are phenomena like radioactive materials and global warming. Hyperobjects stretch our ideas of time and space since they far outlast most human timescales, or they are massively distributed and are so unavailable to immediate experience. At Superflux, we wanted to condense the vast, amorphous form of the climate change hyperobject into something recognizable, tangible, and understandable. One of the things we zoomed in was the implication of climate change on global trade in food. Climate data projections suggest that by 2050, per capita food consumption will go from 32 kilos to 52 kilos, along with increased volatility in price and production, not to mention heavy rainfall events leading to flooding, destroying crops, as well as devastating food stores, assets, and so on. Based on such projections, we explore one possible future where the Western world has moved from abundance to scarcity. We imagine living in a future city with repeated flooding, periods with almost no food in supermarkets, broken supply chains and economic instabilities. What can we do to not just survive, but prosper in such a world? What food can we eat? To really get inside these questions, we did a ton of live prototyping. We explored the possibility of transforming our homes into spaces for growing food or food production, gaining knowledge on new and emerging ways of growing food. And so we started building food computers from scratch, using the technique of fog ponics, so just using nutrient fog, no water or soil, to grow things really quickly. And we wanted to build them in the cheapest way possible, using salvaged, abandoned, and repurposed materials, turning today's waste into tomorrow's dinner. This is a glimpse of our early experiments with John and our son. And now I'll take you to the final outcome It's an apartment that people are transported into in, a, in around, maybe, say, 2050 or so, when my son will be around, six-year-old son will be around my age. At first glance, a seemingly comfortable living space designed for a world of automated living, global trade, and material abundance. But then on closer ins inspection and realization that the apartment has been adapted to a future it was never meant to inhabit. Discarded newspapers and a radio show reflect the tensions of this new world. 
A smart panel constantly asks the fridge to refill milk. But where is the milk in this future? Amongst the detritus of now obsolete smart devices and designer goods lives a new reality formed by the impact of climate change. Recipes in the kitchen reflect the change in food production, storage, and consumption. Experimental food production now occupies space once given to relaxation, transforming the apartment into a space for growing and producing food. Resourcefully hacked together IKEA shelves, decorative fog makers, programmable microcontrollers, plumbing supplies, LED lamps, computer fans. Fog oozing out of these contraptions, blinding purple light, the dro mycelium, droning sounds of water pipes, snares, fox skin, chilies, algae, my spirulina, all bearing fruit in the blasted ruins of capitalism. Looking beyond, there lies a city familiar, yet alien. This project was shown at the Center for Contemporary Culture for the last year, and the intention of such a speculative approach with hands-on experimentation is that it offers us the opportunity to very directly step into a familiar space to confront our fears, not to scare or overwhelm, but to help people critically reflect upon their actions in the present and introduce them to potential adaptations for living in such a future. The evidence in the apartment may reflect a different future, but all the food computers were in a completely working condition. No speculation there. Whilst many of us saw this as an early warning, we also wanted to empower people by demonstrating that the potential to rise to the challenges that the future may hold exists today. We've started putting up the recipes of how to build these food stacks on Instructables, and we'll keep doing so in the year to come. We are at a pivotal point in history where we have everything to play for and everything to lose. In times like this, there's a tendency to look towards existing knowledge for answer, to rely exclusively on the rational and the scientific for solutions. But increasingly, it is becoming evident that this is just not driving the wide-scale behavioral change needed to effectively navigate this critical point in our history. I believe that finding ways to directly and viscerally experience different possible futures and future directions is a very important part of the solution for dealing with our current crises. We need to bring the future close enough to feel. We need to engage both the intellect and the emotion to harness the full power of our innate, embodied intelligence. We need to make informed, thoughtful, and nuanced long-term decisions, and most importantly, to act upon them, not just for ourselves, but for our children and grandchildren and the world they will inhabit, so that we can become proud ancestors for the generations to come. I leave you in the hope that together we can find the necessary tools to transform our greatest challenges into our greatest triumphs. We can be remembered as the generation that looked the future square into the eyes and acted upon what it saw. Thank you. Thank you, Anab. Einstein famously said, imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited, but imagination encompasses the entire world. It's a theme we'll return to again and again this forum, the role of imagination and storytelling in accelerating possibility. But first, as a British person, I want to offer you a very special welcome to Brexit Britain. <laughs> you don't have to be mad to live here, but believe me, right now, it really helps. <laughs> I, I've talked about Lewis Carroll on this stage before, the Oxford mathematician who wrote Alice in Wonderland, but his work seems more relevant than ever. Our entire country has disappeared down the rabbit hole and our parliament taken over by uh, March hares and mad hatters. Confusion abounds.
because, as the Cheshire Cat says, if you don't know where you're going, well, any road will take you there. <laughs> and, I and I want to say a very special thank you to all of you for coming here to this disunited kingdom. <laughs> you are an extraordinary gathering of people working for equality and justice from all four continents. And our country needs you more than ever. We need your ideas, your experiences. We need your internationalism. And thank you for sharing them with us. As populism and nationalism threaten to drag us backwards, we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to work harder and smarter if we want to go faster and forwards. And on that note, it's with much pride that I now introduce our next guest at the forum. An American labor activist whose focus of work for the past 20 years has been the demographic post perhaps most vulnerable in the workforce, domestic workers, nannies, housekeepers, caregivers. As the founder and director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, she organizes for their power, respect, and fair labor standards with extraordinary effectiveness. Please welcome Aijan Pu. Aijan, I'm already such a big fan of your work, and I'm, I'm a huge fan I'm of yours too. To I'm so you excited. To fear, I can find out even more. <laughs> Welcome to Oxford. Welcome to the Skull World Forum. I think it's your first forum. It's my first forum, and I love it already. Everyone I've met here has been so brilliant and so warm. It's there are, been look at them. They're an absolutely lovely crowd. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> They're beaming at us. Um, so I wanted to start by, by asking what led you into the work? It's a classic question, but actually in your case, um, when I was reading you know, your biography, I was really struck by the fact you went straight into this work pretty much from university. I felt like even at university you were beginning to kind of conceptualize that this is where you wanted to kind of put your contribution. But what led the young 20, 21-year-old Aijan to have her imagination captured by domestic workers? Because it wasn't something that was popular or much talked about at the time. What, what led you to it? Well, I was raised by a long line of really strong, amazing women, starting from my grandmothers and my mother. And growing up as a child, I just thought they could do anything. And then growing up, watching just everywhere I went, women underrepresented in positions of power and decision making and overrepresented in positions of vulnerability and abuse. And so I just became interested in women's activism and understanding why things are the way that they are. And um, so I joined women's organizations, I became a women's studies major, and started volunteering at different organizations to learn about how we change this unbelievable inequality that didn't make sense to me. But there's so many different directions that people can uh, go into when they're thinking about women's activism and gender inequality, but your domestic worker focus is, is very kind of razor clear. And as the conversation goes on, I think people are going to understand how foresighted actually you were 20 years ago to kind of locate yourself there. But it's a very specific um, demographic that you, that you saw and thought, wait, hang on, who is, you know, what are the issues going on here? Can you kind of speak to what you saw back then? Well, it, in New York City, um, there's a very large immigrant community in New York, and that's where I was. And I was volunteering at a domestic violence shelter for Asian immigrant women. And because my grandparents raised me, I, I'm bilingual and I speak Mandarin. And so I worked the hotline for the shelter. And many of the women who called were calling in crisis around abuse, but they were also 
calling in just the daily struggles of trying to make ends meet, working incredibly hard in low-wage service jobs and still unable to find housing, put food on the table for their children. And I just wondered how, when these women have overcome the odds and are working incredibly hard, is it that they still can't make ends meet? And that is just the case. There's so many occupations where women are working full-time and more and still can't pay the bills. And then what I saw was women whose work was in the care industry, that this entire part of the economy is basically in the shadows and underground. And so in addition to low wages, there were no standards, no guidelines. It was like the Wild West because we as a society and as a culture and ultimately as an economy, haven't accounted for the incredible amount of work that goes into caring for families. And the collateral damage is millions of women working without protections. So the first organization that you founded was very much New York based and you started, I think, you know, working at a city level and ultimately became a kind of state level, but really focused on New York. Can you talk about what the work actually was um, in terms of the organizing that you were doing and also how it led to the policy changes that you managed to achieve? I mean, I really did not know. I was never professionally trained as an organizer or activist. I just kind of figured it out with other women along the way. And literally, you would have found me in the late 90s going from playground to playground in Central Park or in Riverside Park, talking to the nannies who were there with the children in the playgrounds and just listening to their stories and hearing about what they're worried about, what their hopes and dreams are and organizing meetings and trainings and kind of meeting by meeting, gathering by gathering, we started to build so that every single meeting there were more women and it, more diverse groups of women. And pretty soon asking the question, why is it that when we know the work that we do is so important, it's so undervalued? Why is it that we can't, if we're expected to take care of the families that we support, why can't we take care of our own families doing this work? And so that just started the question of, we should have rights, we should have rec um, recognition as real workers. And that led you to realizing that you needed more than just um, to kind of uh, raise the kind of consciousness or the, or the awareness of rights of the, of the women that you were working with, but actually you needed to have policy change. Yes, yeah, so in New York, we organized the first domestic worker convention in 2003 and had nannies and house cleaners and caregivers from all over the state gather and identify if they could rewrite the labor laws in the United States, what would that look like? So we had 250 women in small groups with simultaneous interpretation in seven languages actually hashing out and re reimagining labor law in New York State. And it was a seven-year campaign, but ultimately New York became the first state in the country to have a domestic worker bill of rights in 2010. <laughs> And New Mexico, just last week, New Mexico became the ninth state to pass legislation. And I feel like at that point you realized that you needed to be working on a national scale. In a way, you used New York perhaps as a kind of proof of concept to yourself um, about the work that you were doing. And at that point, you launched the organization that you're running now with this big national focus. The theme of this conference is Accelerating Possibility, and we've just heard from someone who uh, has been talking about, uh, about the future, and I feel like now that you have this national scope, you're also thinking about literally the future of the American labor force, and I wonder if you could kind of speak to how you see the role, the changing role of domestic workers in that future. I mean, we talked about it before, and I think it's just, it, it kind of, you, you blew me away with a perspective that was right in front of me, but somehow I hadn't grasped it, and I wonder if you could share that with us. Well, one of the things that's been so profound working with this workforce is that I often actually refer to domestic workers as the ultimate futurists 
because even though domestic workers have been working in the margins and in the shadows of our economy, they have really been on the front lines of so many of the major trends that are shaping our future in the United States and perhaps globally. Everything from trends in migration to really looking at the future of work. When I first started organizing domestic workers in 1998, the conditions that defined domestic work were somewhat uh, at the edges of the economy, almost exotic. Um, lack of control over hours, lack of a clear job description, no access to a safety net or any kind of benefits, no training, no job security. And now, when I look around at the American workforce, more and more workers are having that experience, being defined by that level of precarity. Um, Domestic workers were the first to actually alert us to the incredible age wave, the change in the generational demographic in the United States with the boomers aging into retirement at a rate of 10,000 people per day turning 70 in America and living longer than ever because of advances in health care. It was domestic workers who came to us and said, we need training in elder care so that we can support the growing older population and the families who are needing us in this way. And so if we look to the margins, we can find clues, indicators of what's to come, and we can also find incredible solutions. In some ways, our national movement was formed out of a, the failure of many civil society organizations, even the labor movement, um, and our democracy to really represent the interests of this workforce. And so in that exclusion has been an, an incredible amount of innovation. I mean, we just launched our very first uh, portable benefits platform for independent workers out of our innovation lab, where we're able to now provide benefits like disability insurance and paid time off to independent workers like domestic workers for the very first time. And when we fast forward, these trends, that, as you're saying, you know, the, the signals for these trends can be picked up at the margins and, and are and were picked up by these workers and by those who organized with them. But fast forwarding to 2030, we need to be ready for a, a different configuration of workforce, right? Absolutely. So many, many of us have been hearing about how the future of t the technology will shape the future of work in America. And we've been thinking a lot about automation and artificial intelligence. And there's a lot that's unknown about what the future will hold. But one thing we do know for sure is that there's going to be a huge need for elder care a huge need for childcare. These are jobs that are not outsourceable, right? And they won't be automated anytime soon. My colleague, Pollock Shaw, talks about the fact that there's a lab in Los Angeles that's been trying to develop a robot to fold a towel for 11 years and still been <laughs> unsuccessful. So I do believe that we are going to have humans, real people like you and me, caring for the growing older population. These will be a huge share of the jobs of the future. And in fact, many economists are predicting in the United States that by the year 2030, if you take childcare and elder care jobs combined, it'll be the largest occupation in the entire US workforce. So we have got to make these jobs good jobs. And what an incredible opportunity to create a pathway to real economic security where one generation can do better than the next, just like we did with manufacturing jobs in the 20s and 30s. Used to be dangerous poverty wage jobs that a lot of immigrant women did, and we made them pathways to real security and prosperity for millions of families. We can do that again with these jobs. Bravo. And so we need to reimagine these jobs. And coming back to this theme of imagination and storytelling, I want to um, bring into the conversation the film Roma. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Who, who has seen Roma? Right. 
Okay, everyone else who didn't put their hand up, you have to immediately uh, rush back after this and, and catch up with the rest of us. Can you please describe to me um, your feelings when you saw the film? And then I want to talk about the partnership that you've gone into with participant with the film. Yeah. Well, a little bit of context is that as a movement, our job is to put more power in the hands of more everyday people to shape the future. And there are many different kinds of power, and because of how disaggregated and isolated our workforce has been, we've had to be very creative about how we think about power and, and how we build it. So there's political power, which is the more obvious form which we've been building, and it's enabled us to pass legislation in nine states. And there's economic power, which we're developing through work in our innovation lab. And then there's what we call narrative power, which we define as the ability to tell the story of why things are the way that they are in the world on your terms, essentially the power to define reality. And as a workforce that's almost defined by invisibility, to actually be able to seize upon and tell our own story, tell a story that humanizes um, and that gives texture and, and real human dignity to this workforce has been an essential part of our strategy. So when our partners at Participant Media called us and said, hey, there's this film, Roma, we think you might be interested in, we literally did a happy dance all across the country. Um, but, and Participant Media and the director, Alfonso Cuaron, actually invited myself and a domestic worker from Texas, one of our leaders, named Rosa San Luis, to the world premiere at the Venice Film Festival. Um, and so we got on a plane, and we were excited and quite nervous, actually, because we didn't know what it would be like. Like, what if we didn't like it? <laughs> um, but instead, it was the most extraordinary telling of an extraordinarily human story with a domestic worker, an indigenous domestic worker as a protagonist, and it was literally a gift from the heavens for us. And we've got a, a short trailer, um, which just talks a little bit about the way that you're going to be working with the film. I think it's got a, a few, a couple of um, moments from the film as well. So we'll, we'll play that now. <laughs> Everything that we do is, is going to convey a message. The idea manifested to tell the story of the real life person who the character of Cleo is based upon. Her name is Libo. When I saw the movie Roma, I saw myself. And Yes, for coloring. This is what I do. This is my life. To see your own story reflected back on the big screen is a transformative experience. When she saved those kids as part of her job, it was risky, but she did it. I'm not ashamed to say that I am a caregiver because this is the job that makes all jobs possible, and this is a noble profession. Representation really matters. We have to change policy and politics, but we also have to change culture. You need to change hearts and minds before you can turn to policy. Especially hearts. Let's remember, when we talk about voiceless people, we're not talking about people who lack strength. That's right. yeah. Yeah. We're not, so let's not be confused about this. We are talking about strong women. This film sparking a new wave of activism for a Bill of Rights on behalf of two million domestic workers. Roma offers us this opportunity to really shine a light on that. You're going to Los Angeles to attend an Oscar watch party. We're having our first major Oscar watch party. This was a party with a purpose. The very special guests here were domestic workers from around the country. Honoring and supporting one of the 70 million domestic workers in the world. As artists, our job is to look where others don't. 
This responsibility becomes much more important in times when we are being encouraged to look away. Muchas gracias, Alivo. Gracias, gracias, gracias. It's such a beautiful film and really where art meets social justice. Can you talk a little bit more about how you used the kind of moment that the, that the wave that the film was created and how by being involved early enough you were able to kind of craft a strategy which kind of rode the, rode the Roma wave, if you like. And also if you could speak about what colleagues have done in Mexico, that would be, that would be great too. Absolutely. Well, we have... Um, this incredible partnership with participant media and with the director, the filmmaker, Alfonso Cuaron, who really wanted the film to be a platform for the movement to build its power, its voice, and its impact. And that just became such an incredibly fertile ground for real impact in ways that we couldn't really have imagined. First, the first thing we did was actually put the film in front of thousands of domestic workers. So we actually screened the film early on for domestic workers in communities around the country and also for employers so that they could actually use the film to populate the narrative environment in their local communities and with the local media to tell the story, use Roma as an opportunity to tell the story of what it is like today in the United States for domestic workers and these relationships, what would support these relationships to be healthier, to be stronger, to spark a conversation in communities. And then we had this opportunity to work with Senator Harris and Congresswoman Jayapal to introduce the first national Bill of Rights for domestic workers. And we timed it so that the conversation and the announcement about national legislation would come out at around the same time that the film was being released so that the two could be talked about together. Um, and also at the same time, our portable benefits product, Alia. Right, which is a technology pro platform that enables thousands of domestic workers, hopefully millions soon, to get access to benefits for the first time. We've launched that nationally after being in beta for a year um, and actually three years of development. We launched it nationally at also around the same time that Roma was released and um, the award season buzz was starting. And so all of this allowed us to not only change the narrative and spark an important conversation in communities, but also to start to pivot audiences towards real world social impact in policy and in products and in actual market adoption of this important solution for benefits. So the platform is still a relatively, uh, relatively new in its, in its national launch. I know you you were piloting and kind of getting it ready to, to scale it um, for I think two or three years. Yeah. But it's quite relatively new in its national reach. What yeah. do you need to keep pushing forward with that? What kind of um, partners or other, um, you know, other help do you need with that? Well, we need people to sign up. <laughs> we need employers. If you employ a, a house cleaner in your home, the beautiful innovation here is it allows for house cleaners with multiple clients to all contribute in a prorated manner to benefits in a benefits account that the worker then gets to decide which type of benefits she wants to apply the money in her account towards. It's portable. It goes along with her. Um, and it's something that if we can actually scale it for domestic workers, it's unlimited in terms of the fields where lots of different um, types of workers are piecing together independent work, subcontracted work, to be able to give them access to benefits. So we need people to adopt it, to sign up. It's called Alia, um, and you can sign up at myalia.org. Great, thank you. And. Um, with the little bit of time that we have less, I wanted us to pull back out to the bigger picture. Uh, when, we talked, um, when we talked before about this panel and the meaning of accelerating possibility, I really like what you had to say about the, the challenge that we now have about who, who leads and where power sits and, and the role of women in, in, in this work. The reflection really that you can bring from having been in this work for 20 years to this moment and to this question of the future. I wonder if you could just 
share a little bit about what we spoke about with all of them? Well, um, in the United States, we are in the most severe political crisis of generations. And um, when I think about accelerating possibility, the immediate image in my mind that, that comes to my mind is an image of all of the women who marched at the women's marches, all of the women who have been organizing in their community, calling Congress to protect health care, running for office, um, voting in unprecedented numbers, women who are essentially accelerating possibility in the midst of the greatest crisis, uh, existential crisis in our democracy of generations. There's a, if you're from the United States, you might be familiar in the Southeast and in the Midwest, there's a weather phenomenon called a sunstorm. And it's when you have torrential rain and maybe even hail, but the sun is still shining through really brightly. And I often talk about what we're experiencing in the United States as a political sunstorm. And women are the sun in that we've been holding space, we've been showing up, we've been accelerating possibility in the midst of an incredible storm. And if you think about the way that we're showing up, if you were at one of the first women's marches, it was multi-generational, multi-racial, and women were holding signs about every issue under the sun. And there was room enough for all of it. We didn't have to choose. There wasn't a hierarchy. It was about human dignity and the future in the most holistic sense. And I, I trust women to keep accelerating possibility. Um, along with all of you in the room, I think we are all the sun in this incredibly tumultuous time in our world. Ajahn Pu, we're out of time. Thank you. Bravo. That's amazing. Beautiful. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Edgar Vellanueva and Sarika Bansal. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a great opening plenary. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you so much, Edgar, for joining me on stage today. Uh, Edgar Villanueva is the author of Decolonizing Wealth, which is a provocative and really beautifully written analysis of the colonial attitudes that are really present in philanthropy and more generally in finance. And, uh, the impact that these, that these attitudes have on these, on, the, on these sectors. And also he talks a lot about how money can be used not just to divide and exploit, but also to heal. So first of all, thank you so much, Edgar, for being here today and for agreeing to talk about your book. Absolutely, it's an honor to be here with you guys. Um, so in your book, you talk a lot about um, three aspects of your identity in particular. One is your being Native American. Uh, two is your being Southern, and three is your choosing a life in philanthropy. Uh, I'd love to know a little bit more about why these identities are so core to who you are and how you operate in the world. Wow, well, um, what a combo of identities, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, my identity is really important, important to me for, for a lot of reasons. Um, another identity that I have um, is that I'm the son of a domestic worker. So I'm feeling a little emotional from that last conversation. It was so beautiful. Um, and uh, so yes, my identity as a Native American, as someone who's from the US South is really important uh, because for the most part, indigenous people around the world are very invisible. Um, and especially in the United States, uh, Native Americans are quite invisible, particularly in the U.S. South, where we were the first point of contact for colonization. And so um, actually being a part of uh, maintaining that identity and, um, you know, especially working in a space that has had, you know, quite a bit of forced assimilation to how I show up as a leader, um, working with a lot of people with wealth and institutions with wealth, uh, being grounded in that uh, identity of where I'm from and remembering that and bringing that with me into the work has really shaped my analysis around how I do this, how I show up as a leader. 
That's a, yeah, I love the concept of you know the forced assimilation in philanthropy. I feel like there is just such a, a tending towards the norm that you often see, which you bring up a lot. Um, you also, t I mean, the core of the book is really about colonization and decolonization. Of course, that's the title. So why use these terms that you know for so many people are very provocative? Um, like, what, what's the power of talking about wealth in these kinds of ways? Well, you know, I. Um I had to go on my own journey to learn about colonization, although I'm Native American, because when I was growing up in school, uh, we were not taught the accurate history of the United States. I sort of bought into the fantasy that uh, you know pilgrims came over and that my ancestors met them there, and we all sat down and ate turkey together, you know, <laughs> and um, and so it wasn't until much later in life that I actually learned the accurate history of what happened in, in the United States. And you know, it's frankly, it's a it's a dark uh, a, a dark history that um, folks don't want to revisit. Often, it's easy to kind of sweep it under the carpet and want to look forward. Um, but what I realized as an adult is that there's a lot of trauma in my community, in my immediate family. We have mass incarceration and ab abuse. Um, we see, um, you know, violence and uh, a lack of education. I'm the first person in my family to graduate from high school. And so this, these cycles of trauma that exist in indigenous communities, and my tribe is the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, you know, are the result of a history that was not that long ago. Actually, my parents, uh, my grandparents' generation, uh, native children were forcibly uh, removed from their homes and put in boarding schools and not allowed to speak the language and not allowed to identify with the culture. And so those types of um, atrocities, colonization is absolutely an atrocity, um, have lingering impacts. And as we're thinking about the future and talking about progress, we have to do that with the lens of, well, what is the historical context of the issues that we're trying to solve? Because that history, whether we are honest about it, whether it makes us uncomfortable, whether we are um, kind of agnostic to it, the history happened and it is absolutely connected to the problems that we're trying to solve current day. How, does, how do you think the history is connected specifically to philanthropy? So, it, you know, in philanthropy, it, it, there's a, a lot of uh, manifestations of what I call the colonizing virus. So we often think of colonization as something in the U.S. that started 500 years ago. And it's often something that we think of uh, with pride. Um, in fact, there was a, a, a study that I referenced in my book in the UK from 2014 that interviewed uh, uh, folks in this country about their impressions about colonization um, and uh, Great Britain's history of, uh, with the British Empire. Uh, you know, in the 20s, not that long ago, this country uh, controlled a third um, or a fourth of the, the world's population and controlled about a fifth of land. And uh, most people responded, about 59% of those respondents in that survey said that colonization was a good thing and the world is better off. And so there's a, there's a mindset that I liken to a virus that still is being per, um, petru perpetuated. And it shows up in our policies and our systems and, um, and, and who gets to uh, be a leader who is esteemed as an expert. Uh, who gets to control, allocate, and, and, and manage wealth. And so as it pertains to philanthropy, you know, colonization was about uh, accumulating wealth, right? And so fast forward to present day with uh, foundations uh, and, and, and folks who are investors, there's a, a history there about how that wealth was accumulated, right? On whose back was that wealth earned? And now we are part of these institutions and making decisions about how that money is given out. And where we see those colonial dynamics showing up is one, uh, who gets to make decisions around uh, how uh, investments are, are, are managed, uh, who gets to allocate that money, and who's benefiting from that money. We see still a very small percentage of philanthropic dollars being invested in communities of color. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's, um, thank you. It's, it's, it feels a really sort of an injustice when you think about the history and the role that communities of color have played 
in the margins um, in helping to build wealth around the world through you know, genocide and stolen land, things that are kind of uncomfortable to discuss, but it's a reality uh, that wealth was accumulated in this ways in many places. And so we owe it to ourselves, those of us who manage and allocate funds and invest philanthropic dollars, we owe it to ourselves to understand the history of how wealth was accumulated and then to allocate and invest and give money away uh, in a way that respects that history. Yeah. It's such a beautiful perspective. So speaking of like how wealth was accumulated and who controls it, you talk a lot about how white the philanthropic sector is and how little money is flowing to communities of color and how there's just a status quo that's being perpetuated. So what exactly, what do you mean by worshiping the status quo and how that plays out in philanthropy? Well, worshiping the status quo, um, you know, I think, of this, I think of sort of the opposite of the status quo is progress or change, right? And change is hard for all of us. It's not, uh, we have to get really uncomfortable with, with change. And I think within philanthropy, um, there can be quite a bit of comfort working in those institutions. I, I did not come from wealth, obviously, and um, have, uh, have to admit that I have been quite comfortable working in the field with the perks and the incentives that it provides. Um, however, you know, I think uh, to, to see change happen, and especially in those institutions that are in, in some ways like a, a, a bubble of privilege, like a microcosm cosm of, uh, of privilege and, and wealth, uh, we have to be willing to get uh, uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and sometimes actually super uncomfortable and, and lean into that discomfort in order to see change happen. And where we need to see change happen is in so many ways, um, but you, you mentioned sort of uh, whiteness and of course what, where we see where uh, white folks around the world hold the majority of wealth, therefore foundations that are started are, are most often started by white folks who then uh, sit at the leadership of foundations. The majority of foundation boards in the US are white men. Uh, the majority of CEOs of foundations are white folks, the majority of staff. And then uh, you see about 95% uh, about of grant making dollars going to institutions that are white led. And so uh, we have to really examine that. And if we really want to see change happen, as we heard earlier uh, today, uh, change is happening in the margins. There's a lot of solutions and really good ideas and, and brave thinking happening from folks who have not been privileged to be a part of those circles. And we need to tap into that in order to see change. And that means shifting yeah. the status quo. Absolutely. Um. So I'm also curious about how, of course, you know, your book and your experience are largely American. Um, I live in Nairobi, Kenya, which is also sometimes called a Silicon Savannah. Um, <laughs> some other people are from Nairobi here. And uh, because of, so it's called a Silicon Savannah sometimes because of the large number of social enterprises there and a lot of the change making that's taking place. Um, though even within those circles and even within who gets funding there, I feel like I see a lot of these, these themes that you're mentioning be replicated over there. So I'm wondering if you've seen in any way, ways that the, you know, your, the, your findings that while writing the book, how they may translate internationally. Yeah, I mean, there absolutely the concepts in the book. When we're talking about colonization, I mean, that's a global phenomenon, right? It's something that's been happening. And I, there's also this idea of what I call global bleaching, which is really this force to, like force assimilation, as we were saying earlier, this force to uh, take out anything that is not, uh, you know, sort of the, the dominant culture. And so we see languages, um, you know, being erased. We see cultures being erased. We see people that um, are not in power being eradicated. This is still happening around the world. And we may not see in some places uh, colonization happening in, in quite the literal visual way that you might be imagining it, but it's still happening in subtle ways because as like any virus, the colonizing virus uh, mutates and expands to different ways of operating. And so we have to be really attuned to those dynamics 
um, at play. So absolutely what's happened uh, in the U.S., you know, uh, foundations in, in many sense, uh, instances are uh, a U.S. construct because of our tax system there that, um, you know, allows major incentives to start foundations. But the dynamics of colonization, the dynamics of white supremacy uh, that show up in, in, in our policies and systems and who, the, who haves and who, who have not, the haves and the have nots, um, is, is absolutely something that is uh, across the board in every country where we see uh, people who are in power and people who are not in power and who controls resources. Um, um, so, thank you so much. So, I'm so grateful that the second half of your book is focused not just on the problem and all of these, all of these really deep-seated issues that you're talking about. But the second half of the book is called How to Heal. And it's a very difficult, long process. I don't want to just you know, try to say that, oh, just follow these five easy steps and you're there. <laughs> but, uh, but there are things that people can do in their everyday lives to actually think about decolonizing themselves and actually healing. Um, and one of, the, one of the themes that I really love that you talk about is how money for so long has been used in many ways to divide and to exploit, but that we can redirect money and that it's not that money itself has no value. It only has the value that we attach to it and that money can be used to heal and to, and to love. So I'd love to know a little bit more about what you mean about that. Sure. So, uh, you know, being Native American, working in philanthropy now for 15 years, which I know I don't look a day above 30, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'm a rare phenomenon, a Native American from a poor family that works in philanthropy. And I think when I started, there were about 10 of us uh, in the U.S., and I think there's probably 25 now. We're growing in numbers. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I... I uh, came into this work because I really wanted to see change in communities, right? Passionate about change. I was hired uh, because of my experience, real world experience in the communities that these foundations cared for. And um, it wasn't uh, very long before I became very frustrated and felt a lot of pain actually about uh, trying to do this work that, uh, you know, with an institution, institutions that had a mission for change and, uh, you know, even social justice, but the actual uh, realities of doing that work were quite complicated, quite complicated. This is complicated work. There are a lot of contradictions. And so initially I, uh, at times, felt even angry because I wasn't able to uh, respond to the community in the way that I wanted to. And I was caught in the middle in a sense, right? Because I worked inside the, the, the bubble of privilege, but I was also accountable to my own community. And that frustration at one point even became anger. And I had a, a, a sense of a, a loss of my own identity because I had assimilated so much to the type of leadership that had been modeled to me, what had been lifted up as, as a good leader. And uh, when I took a break from working in philanthropy for a little while, I, uh, in, in writing this book, I went back to my home community, the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, and just immersed myself in my culture, re talking to my rel relatives, talking to elders in my community, and I asked questions like, what is philanthropy? No one knew what that word was. <laughs> I was like, what does that word mean? Um, but what I, what I realized, you know, uh, during that time is that uh, what, the, the way out of this for, for all of us, not just for me, but for all of us, the way out of this was really an indigenous perspective, indigenous wisdom of really understanding that we all have a gift, a, a contribution, right? And I know that in the audience tonight, you all are entrepreneurs and you're working, you have a gift and a calling, something that you feel really led to do to, to make the world a better place. And I was conflicted because I was like, my, my gift is like moving money. Like, isn't money like bad and dirty or like there's a lot of negative connotations with that and I had an elder to say to me that the medicine that had chosen me was money and in my culture we say that you don't choose your medicine the medicine chooses you and so I had this paradox moment where I had to understand that the, the, the medicine that chose me was money. And by medicine, what we mean in our culture is that um, it's something that is sacred, something that is your, your, brings balance to you, something that's a life-giving force, 
um, for uh, you to, your vehicle for change in the world. And so at the moment that I realized that it wasn't about the money, money was neutral. Money is just a proxy for relationships. It's just a, it's a symbol for something. Money has been used wrong in the past. It's been used to dominate, to oppress, uh, to separate, to divide. But we all have a, a choice that we can make that we can use money as medicine. We can use money to facilitate healing, connection, belonging, and actually responding to the harm and the trauma that has been left behind from colonization by moving money in ways that help to heal that past, by moving money to where the hurt is the worst, and that is in communities of color. That's so beautiful, thank you. So that leads me so well into this quote that I have from your book uh, regarding proximity which was actually, I believe, last year's Skull World Forum theme about the power of proximity. And you talk about you know, just being in communities. Um, so you write, deep authentic knowledge does not come from reading statistics or reports. It doesn't even come from a site visit to a community center or interviewing someone from the affected community. It, come from, it comes from living inside that community and, experience, and experiencing that issue for oneself, period. So tell me more about the power of proximity and being with community in order to facilitate this healing process. Proximity is everything. Um, you know, we are all traumatized by history, right? Um, even folks who may be descendants of colonizers, there's trauma that is left behind with all of us by subscribing to that idea of dominance, of oppression, for participating in various ways, however our ancestors may have been a part of that, right? And so when we fast forward now to the 21st century, we're all here and we all have experienced pain as human beings. We've all experienced trauma. And so there's the opportunity to think about how can we get in community with each other, although we may be very different, right? But understand that those of us who are from the margins, those of us who have long histories of being resilient, right? Like my tribe, we are resilient. 500 years and we're still here, right? And so we kind of have a corner on resilience in a lot of ways, <laughs> right? So understand that when you come from privilege, um, often that privilege can blind you to solutions that work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not a license to cop out. We all have a role to play in decolonization. We all have a role to play in healing. We all have a role to play in shifting our thinking to a way that's not a, a, a white dominant way of thinking, but a way that is inclusive of all perspectives. And that's only gonna happen when we sit down together and begin a conversation around things that are often uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Here's to getting uncomfortable. <laughs> So that leads me actually, I, I would love for you to leave the audience with some actual practical advice. So this beautiful, amazing audience here today includes many philanthropists, includes many social entrepreneurs, community organizers, nonprofit leaders, and there's a lot of conversations that happen. There's a lot of conversations between people with money and people looking for money that happened this week. So what are a couple of things that you think in particular the philanthropists and the audience can do this week to begin to put some of these ideas into practice, to begin to decolonize themselves? You know, I think um, acknowledging the power dynamic that I understand that some deals might be happening this week, right? And so let's move beyond the, the transactional relationship with each other talk business, make your pitches, whatever uh, we all are gonna do this week, but let's try to see each other as human beings, right? No one's an ATM, no one is a person who's an, uh, an asker or a taker, right? Let's come together around uh, centering communities, centering change that needs to happen across this globe, um, and try to start there um, around some connection. I think uh, we often sit down and there's the anxiety of like, I'm gonna be asked for something that I can't give, or I need, I need these resources, is if we can kind of put that game and that dance aside to really connect with each other on a very personal uh, level, um, that is actually what decolonization is. It's actually just radical listening, radical connecting with each other. Put your phones down for a minute and engage with each other as human beings. Listen to the stories of folks that uh, come from a different community than you. Allow your mind to be open. If you feel uncomfortable, lean into that and just sit in that and know, wow, like I'm actually growing and stretching as a 
a person because I feel uncomfortable. Those are all parts of decolonization. It's not that radical or sophisticated of a notion. When you think about it, it's actually just going back to a state of being in a circle together, understanding the concept of all my relations. We are all related, right? Our suffering is mutual and our thriving is mutual. Thank you, thank you so much. So I hope this week, if any of you do feel uncomfortable, that you do lean into it, that it is ultimately productive. Don't shy away from it, don't run away, but actually think to yourself, is this a meeting I would have normally? And maybe take something that you wouldn't do. Um, so thank you, thank you again thank you. so much, Edgar. For Absolutely, your... it's an honor to talk with you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so next, we're going to hear from a very special guest. Prince Jesse is a 23-year-old visual artist who's come here from Accra, Ghana. And using an iPhone, he captures a colorful, moving side of his hometown. He's also founded a nonprofit organization called Boxed Kids that helps children from a poor neighborhood of Accra lean into their inherent creativity and, um, and turn to education instead of work. So please welcome to the stage, Prince Jesse. Good evening. My name is Prince Jesse. I'm a visual artist and co-founder of Basket. Um, I'm from Accra, Ghana, West Africa to be precise. Um, I usually tell stories through my iPhone lens and with the use of color. The big question is, why do I use an iPhone and why do I use color? I don't use an iPhone just because I want to be unique, but I use an iPhone because I believe as an artist, you, you can use whatever tool or whatever equipment you have to tell your stories. I also use color because I want people to be mentally and emotionally healed by just looking at my images or my art pieces. Let's see the Im first image. This is a little kid, a six-year-old black American, who is the first black American to be accepted in an all-white public school. She is Ruby Bridges. I think she's old now. Um, so I usually tell stories with a theme of, um, around the themes of um, education, hope, love, um, care, guidance, and so on. As an artist, I think for me to be able to contribute to the solutions to the problems of Africa or Ghana, I have to use my art or my iPhone to tell these stories to create awareness in Ghana. So I decided to create something around this theme, education. This shows that education has been a problem for a very long time for people of color. So I created a present visual representation of education, which is this one. It's from the Faces series, and it's called Ignorance Costs Money Too. In Ghana, people usually say education is expensive. Forgetting that ignorance is expensive too. It costs way more money than education. In an old district called Jamestown in Accra, which played a part in slavery back in the days, there are kids who are, indulged, are indulging in fishing when they're given bed to, in, to this F, actually. When, when their parents give birth to them, they go through a cycle of fishing and they never make it to school. And they grow up to become fishmongers or fishermen. This is contributing to poverty in Africa. People forget that education could be a bigger solution to all our problems. This is a kid who has to sell this stuff and give the money to their parents for his or her parent to be able to provide food for them. This is a kid who has to sell oranges, give the money to their parents as well for a parent to provide food for them. This was shot in Elmina, which also played a part in slavery, but with the same background story that people, the kids in Jamestown are facing. This also showed 
this is a visual representation of strength. Um, I'm saying that if we're able to solve a problem of education, this kid could be a better, a better people or great leaders in future. This is the weight two from the Basket series. I wanted to talk a little bit about Basket. Basket is an, a non-profit organization. I'm a co-founder. Uh, my partner is Kukwa. She's based in the U.S. This ki these kids, I found them at 6 a.m. in November 2018. These kids were hungry. And I asked them, why are you sitting there? They said, this is something that we go through every single day. We never know what we're going to eat in a day. All we know is we're going to join our parents in fishing in order to eat at the end of the day. I found it very sad, and as an artist, I thought there's a need for me to tell these stories through my art. This is an evidence. The kids are fishing. If they don't do this, they don't eat at the end of the day. The reason why I play with colors a lot is because most visual artists tell African stories in a negative way. Even though we're going through difficulties, I think for the new generation, especially me, I have to tell these stories in a more beautiful way. So these kids, when they see them, they know that I can be or they can be great people in future because this signifies hope. These are twins in Jamestown. No. <laughs> yeah, so this image right here, before I get into it, I have mild synesthesia. I don't know if you know about that. I see words in colors. Yeah, so I see words or alphabets in colors. So A is red, B is yellow, C is white, D is black, E is brown, F is orange, G is dark green, H is peach, I is white, J is dark green as well, and so on. The reason why I use red, the reason why I'm speaking about this, is because red signifies labor, blood, sacrifice. And I think this piece called Fatherhood, which is one of my, my, my most powerful pieces I've ever created, is telling a story of a kid who doesn't have a father figure in their lives. This is a true story from Jamestown, but obviously this is not a kid who lost his parents, but I wanted to use the early stage of a kid to depict the story of this kid from Jamestown. And this kid lost his parents and has no father figure in their lives. Education being a problem already, imagine not having a father in your life. You will not be able to go to school, number one, and not be able to eat as well. You go hungry. So I thought I should create something about fatherhood, to show that we don't have to be biological fathers or biological siblings to these kids, but we can still show the love a father will show to a child. The reason I use red is because, like I said, labor. And the reason I use blue is because I want to tell you that if you are able to show this love or care to this kid, blue signifies calmness. All these mental health issues they're going through, they're definitely going to be calm and everything will be great for them. This is a continuation of fatherhood. This is all called Almost Home. It also tells us the journey of the kid having a father figure who's guiding them through life and showing them what is right and what is wrong. Before I get to that, I also see the days of the week in colors. <laughs> Monday is brown, Tuesday is orange, as you can see. School forum is also orange. Wednesday is blue, Thursday is gray, Friday is red, Saturday is white, Sunday is green. I see these things and it has helped me develop my use of color. So everything I do with color is meaningful. It's not just, I don't just choose them. This is called agony of orphan. It shows the pain that losing a father in your life brings to a child. This is the burden they go through, the burden they carry. This, the stone signifies a burden. Of course, I can't put too many stones. <laughs> you can't carry them. 
This is a powerful piece called Patience and Purpose. Mostly, people fight the process of life. I believe that if you trust the process and you work hard and you focus, everything you're creating, when it comes together, there will be a greater picture. You can see two guys looking at one direction because they believe that if they trust the process, they're going to be great people in future. So as you can see, I use blue because it signifies calmness and white because it signifies victory. So whatever you're creating, if you're calm, you're patient, and you trust the process, you're going to be victorious at the end of the day. This is a visual representation of kids playing, and I, I call it seeds because I want, it's a continuation of what I showed you earlier. It simply means that seeds take time to grow. So whatever you're creating, don't give up. Keep going, keep going, and you'll definitely reach your potential. This is a man of many nations. As you can see, all these colors represent every color of a country in the world. This man is a great leader now because he trusted the process. So it's definitely, it's just conceptual storytelling that I usually do with my art. This is Crumple Zone from the Control Series. Control Series is, um, I just wanted to let people know that certain times we have weaknesses and we, we give too much strength to, to the weaknesses. I believe we can channel our energy to our weakness and turn them into strength. So that's why I created this, because usually in Accra, Ghana, I'll tell you a story. In Accra, Ghana, usually when you're late, you take a motorbike because you want to maneuver your way through. And I believe that if we focus, sometimes there will be bad situations, there will be obstacles that we have to do certain things to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. So for me, in the abstract idea, I, I decided to use helmets. Because in, in that way, it's telling you, run fast, but don't run out of gas. This is Energy is Contagious from also the Control Series. Um, you can see these zippers. Usually, zippers open uh, a, a way to certain parts I don't want to mention, but I wanted to use this to be able to um, tell you a story of how we can, we can protect ourselves from certain energies because these are what contribute to our mental health. And if you are, in, you are having mental health issues, don't be afraid to speak out to a friend or talk to a friend. This also talks about what goes on in Africa sometimes. I know all over the world it happens. When people are pushing through something, this water signifies hope and the sacrifice that this guy has put into his, his life or his career. But there are certain people who are usually pulling you back because they don't want you to be where you want to be. Obviously, bondage, mental slavery, like I said. And this is um, from the Faces series called Mood Swings. Um, it's a visual representation of uh, how people who have mental health go through mood swings, different emotions. And I wanted to show that visually because I always thought, how can I show this? How can I help people to be able to see this? I see all emotions in colors as well. This is very important for every woman to see this. In Africa, in Ghana, women usually go through a lot when they are growing up, they have a lot of responsibilities. They take care of their kids, they sacrifice. And when they get married, before even when they have a kid, when they get married, they take care of their, their husbands as well, because some husbands are a bit not disorganized. <laughs> so I, I was, I'm showing this as responsibility. That's the name, the name is responsibility. So I'm showing how women from Africa are responsible and how they strive to helping men grow. Because every successful woman, there's a woman behind that man. This is dignity. It's also um, the same story. If we're able to solve this problem, which Busquets is doing, if we're able to do this, these kids are gonna come out with flying colors. This, is, this shows the strength of motherhood in Africa. This is how visually Mothers carry their babies in Ghana. I mean, we're in the modern world now. People push, but we still do this. We still do this because we believe this is more safer. 
this shows the strength of women. Women have to sell stuff in Ghana to be able to provide food for their kids. It's very important that we all know this, because I know most people haven't been to Africa or Ghana yet. But I always wanted to tell a story of how women, how powerful women are from Ghana. This is also a modern way of showing the strength of women, as you can see. This is called the symbols of womanhood. It's self-explanatory. Yes, for that. So Buskis is basically trying to help kids get an education. Um, it was inspired by when my partner and I went to Jamestown, and we found a kid making boats out of sticks. We thought this is creative, but this kid doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know this could be the purpose of his life because he doesn't have education. So for me, in 2016, my mom is a singer. She got donations from other people when she did a fanfare for these kids in Jamestown. And she was giving them food and drinks. But for me, as an artist, I thought food and drinks doesn't solve the problem. So what can I do? When I make money, I'm going to give education to these kids. But I found out in 2017 that I don't need money to do this. I can always use my art to tell these stories, create awareness, and create a system that can solve these problems. So th that's what Boss Kids is. And Boss Kids simply means a kid who's trapped in a, a situation that they, don't, they can't get out of. And in other words, this situation is a box. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Prince Jesse, and this is my story. When things feel hopeless, it's all too much and you can't take it anymore. That's when to reach out. <laughs>